these institutions to, to interrogate what we mean by confrontation mm -hmm. and to inter interrogate what we mean by debate. Mm -hmm. um, because if the debate is whether or not I am as valuable as other human beings, that's not actually a debate, that's an attempt to, uh, to uphold um, a status quo of my oppression. Yes. And, and I'm not interested in that. I don't actually think there's, I don't think that's learning. No. no, no. Right? Uh, and so anyway, I just need to say that because that was on my heart from the oh, And so we're going to have this conversation that I like to call Dancing at Your Party Ain't That Fun. <laughs> Calling in diversity and inclusion from a radical self love framework. I want to start the conversation, well, first I'll just talk a little bit about what I hope to cover in this conversation. Who am I and why does it matter? Who is the Body is Not an Apology, uh, this, this organization that I am representing today? Um, what is radical self-love and why the body? Why do I use the body as a framework by which I engage in these conversations? How does using a radical self-love framework in the body change the party? Uh, and a new party and a new guest list. How do we make a new party and a new guest list? That's mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I think of this conversation of diversity and inclusion as a party. I thought of it when, when, when we first started talking about it, it was like, it's like, you know, it's like being in fifth grade and, you know, the, the popular girl in class has a slumber party, but you didn't get invited. <laughs> Right? And so now you're in your feelings, you've been in your feelings, you're 35 now, you're still in your feelings. To the summer party in fifth grade, right? Um, but the popular girl now feels bad about the fact that she left out the misfits in class. And so now she's like, okay, um, I'm having a do over at the summer party, I'm going to invite you now, right? Um, and so I, I, I just want to talk about the framework of that party and whether or not. At this point, we even want to go. <laughs> That's a conversation. Uh, but before we do that, I want to situate myself in that conversation. I think it is important that in these spaces that we acknowledge who we are. I come to this conversation from a specific vantage point based on my lived experience at the intersection of multiple identities, right? And the reality is one of the things that I think is important for us to remember in this conversation of intersectionality is that there are none of us who do not live at the intersection of identities. It just happens to be that some of those identities are really privileged and blessed in the world and others of those are disadvantaged and oppressed, right? But being a straight, white, able-bodied male is the intersection of some identities. It just happens to be the ones that are most privileged in our societies, right? And so in this conversation, I think it's important that we acknowledge who we are. I am an artist and an activist. I'm a serious macaroni and cheese maker. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a lover of my Yorkshire Terrier, Anastasia Duchess. I am uh, black, queer, fat, neurodivergent, upwardly class, mobile, college and grad school, educated, etc., etc., etc. That's, that's not my macaroni and cheese, y'all. I always want to lie about it and claim it like it's mine. It's Google's macaroni and cheese. <laughs> um, but that is my dog, Anastasia Dutch. Aww. And she's so okay. I miss her so much right now. Uh, she's in New Zealand. And she can't ever leave New Zealand. That's how the immigration situation works. Uh, why does it matter? Why do these identities matter? They matter because... Owning my identities dismantles personal shame and reclaims power. That I can't actually be shamed for a thing I'm unapologetic about, right? Uh, and so there is a way in which the structures that would attempt to um, certainly institutionally and systemically oppress me as a result of those identities immediately are met with my challenge and my dis resistance and my disruption as a result of my willingness to 100% own those identities. Mm. Um, it is an act of resistance to uh, be unapologetic with me, as we shared earlier. Right? And owning them illuminates how they, are, how they are impacted by a system that I call body terrorism. Mm. And body terror, we'll talk more about what I mean when I use that language and why I use that language. Um, but owning my identity, again, situates me in the conversation and illuminates the ways in which our societies are either structured to privilege those identities or to make them disadvantaged. Whose body is not an apology? I think it's important, again, in this idea of situation.
situating who I am is to talk about the work that I do. So, The Body is Not Oncology is a digital media and education company committed to radical self-love as the foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. We're a digital media company that believes that, in many ways, um, inequity and injustice and oppression are a manifestation of our inability to make peace with the body, our own body and other people's bodies. Uh, and through information dissemination, community building, and education, we foster global, radical, unapologetic self-love, which we believe translates into radical human love and action in service for a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. That what it is that we say we would like to build externally cannot be built until it's built internally. That the things we say we want to see our institutions look like, and our schools look like, and our uh, political systems look like, and our social atmospheres look like, are not possible if we have not cultivated them inside of ourselves. We simply don't have the tools to make that world come into being. And so we propose, through this framework of radical self-love, that there is an opportunity to bring forth those visions in our own selves so that we might see them manifest in the world. Uh, we were founded, well, so our digital media platform was founded in 2015. The Body is Not Apology initially started as a Facebook page. Mm. Actually, man, I'm going to rewind that a little bit. The Body is Not Apology started as a conversation with a friend of mine. I had a friend who had an unintended pregnancy, or was afraid that she had an unintended pregnancy. And we were talking through what that meant for her. And I'm the kind of friend who gets in your business <laughs> from a place of love. Uh, and so from my loving nosiness, I asked my partner, about, um, I asked my friend why she was having unprotected sex with this casual partner that she didn't care that much about. And I didn't ask her um, with any judgment in my tone. I didn't ask, a, you know, I didn't ask like she did something I had never done. Right? I asked, like, hmm, let me, let me hear your story and I'll tell you mine. Um, and from that place, my friend actually offered me what I like to consider an example of radical honesty and radical vulnerability. Um, and in that moment, she said to me, my friend uh, had cerebral palsy, and she said, um, being sexual is difficult with, because of my disability, so I didn't feel entitled to ask this person to use a condom. And my response to her, with, with my unconscious response to her, it just came forth without any thoughts, and it was not a word I had ever uttered previously to this moment. I said to her, your body is not an apology. It is not something you offer to someone to say sorry for my disability. And when I said that, something stuck. It was obviously not just a word for her, it was a word for me. Um, and, it's, and so it started making a thing that I didn't know what it was making yet, but it was making something in me. It was because to direct a pathway um, that I was obviously assigned to walk, and I didn't know that at the time. So that conversation happened uh, um, in 2010, um, and those words began to shape the way that I was moving in the world. So one, I am a performance poet historically. That has been my career for the last uh, decade and a half. Um, and so when I say something and it speaks to me, I'm like, mm, that's going to be a poem. <laughs> <laughs> that just, it felt like a poem. So I was like, that's going to be a poem. So I wrote a poem called The Body Is Not An Apology. And I began presenting and sharing that poem out in the world. And I'm a firm believer. I, I always say I'm a firm believer, but the truth is, this is an objective fact. Language makes the world. You know, I don't have to believe that language makes the world. We don't nuke each other because some people said some stuff and then wrote it down. Yeah. And right now that thin-ass piece of paper is why we're not engaged in nuclear annihilation, mm -hmm. right? So the language creates the world. Uh, and so the language that I speak over my own life is also creating my material reality as I'm speaking it. So I was running around on stage and saying the body is not an apology. The body is not an apology. And I think that one of two things happen when we, are, um, when we are creating language and it is materializing in the world. One of two things will happen. Either we are in alignment with the language we're speaking and it is pushing us forward in the direction in which we desire to go, or we are not in alignment with, the, with what we're speaking and then it gets uncomfortable for us. Mm. It's like walking into a briar patch. 
I just said a thing, now I gotta go stand in the thorns mm -hmm. of the thing I just said. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there were ways in which I believed this, this thing, the body is not an apology, and then there were ways in which it was very clear that I did not. And those places started becoming uncomfortable. And they were tiny things, they were not, um, you know, they were not profound or monumental at the moment. They were little things. One of those little things was I had a selfie in my phone. A picture I had snapped as I was preparing for an event. I had on a black corset and I was getting ready for my show. And I felt sexy, y'all. I was giving it to the people as I was saying. <laughs> and, and I was also acutely aware of what I thought the world would say if I shared this picture what I like to call today the outside voice inside of us, the voice that is the voice of um, shame and degradation and all the ways in which you're not enough, and girl, you are too fat, you are too black, you are too, 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 or not enough, not enough, not enough to share this photo. And so I had to share the photo. It just lived inside of my phone for like five months, six months. Um, and everything, except every once and, once and again, I'd be like, you should really look at this picture. Uh, <laughs> to the people. Uh, so, <laughs> and so it became clear to me one day, uh, someone posted a photo of a plus size model on my Facebook page. And her name was Carolyn, and she's delicious, is the way I describe it. That's probably inappropriate to describe her as delicious, but that's how I feel about it. Uh, and so I started looking up other photos of Carolyn. And one of the first pictures that I saw of her was her um, in a black corset for an event she had, just, she had just been hired as a lingerie model. And I thought to myself, somebody paid this woman a lot of money to put her juicy thighs all over the internet. Why am I tripping about my picture? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, Tara Lynn gave me permission from wherever she was in the world. It didn't have nothing to do with me. She didn't even know I existed. But her choice to be unapologetic to her body in that moment permissioned me to do the same in a living room in California. And so I decided to post my photo. Uh, and in the caption, I said, 230 pounds. I had a terrible tattoo I got when I was 20. Don't be like me. But I feel powerful and beautiful in my body. Post a photo where you feel powerful and beautiful in your body, too. That was February 9th of 2011. Uh, the next morning, I woke up and 30 people and tagged me in photos. People and people of all kinds of bodies. Mm -hmm. Fat bodies and thin bodies, disabled bodies, black bodies, queer bodies, um, aging bodies, <coughs> people in all sorts of bodies were celebrating themselves. And I was like, this is awesome. I think I think I should start a Facebook page. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, because that's what we do. Yeah. I'm, this, you know, I'm on the brink of millennial. That's what I do, right? So I started a Facebook page and I was like, I have this poem. I'm going to call it The Body Is Not An Apology. So I called the Facebook page, The Body Is Not An Apology. And it started with the 30 people who tagged themselves in photos. And those 30 people became 300 people, became 3,000 people, became 30,000 people. Um, and today, we're an international digital media platform whose content reaches about a million people in 145 countries, promoting the idea of national society. make a more just, equitable, and compassionate world possible. So I say all of that to say that like sometimes, you know, some little stuff, like a selfie, right, can do, is, is planning to do a thing that is beyond whatever it is you might have thought. You know, I, I imagine, Dr. Crenshaw, that when you started um, thinking about the theory of intersectionality, you know, and, and this case around degraphenity, you did not imagine that it would be on Team Vogue, or, <laughs> right? You didn't imagine that you would be just Googling every where you went, somebody be sending you some videos about intersectionality, right? Um, and that's, that's how purpose works. That's, I really deeply believe that that's how purpose works. 